Um, and of course, then the benefit of recording these sessions. So anybody that wants to go and look at this afterwards, and even if you want to go and look at previous webinars that's been over the last year or two, all of them are available on our YouTube link that was part of the, the invite. So anybody can go and have a look there. But today, um, yeah, I'm pleased to, to welcome um, Professor Kevin Loeb from, from Rose University. Kevin, thank you very much for, for making the time um, to come and talk about your work. Um, of course, um, when I look at, at, at you as a PI at the CHPC, I don't even know when you started using the, the CHPC. It must be so many years ago. I know you were onto Lengau since its launch, but you were probably a user even in the years before Lengau. Um, so, so you are truly one of our long-term PIs and, and can speak, I suppose, with lots of experience on, on, on what you have done at CHPC and how the, the, the support has been. So, so you're welcome to mention in your talk, of course, but maybe just for the others, maybe I just want to highlight two things. So Professor Lobe at Rose University for the past 15 years already, he's a NMR specialist, but very much focused also, of course, on, on computational chemistry um, applications and, and also closely linking your work, Kevin, to, to bioinformatics um, applications and, and research projects, um, also with other units like um, the Ruby Group at, at um, Rhodes University. Um, he has already authored or co-authored 72 papers um, and graduated 39 students. So it's a, it's a very active research group, um, Kevin, and it's, it's continuing with current Currently five PhD, one MSc, so, so yeah, it's, it's busy on your side. Um, so I can just mention that your research program, Kevin, I don't know whether you do it, um, since the of Lengau, you've used 9.2 million core hours. Now in CHPC talk, this is a significant usage. Um, it's not the big, but it is one of the bigger ones uh, in terms of, of making use of the resources. And um, I, I trust that these hours <laughs> have produced many important research outputs for you. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, maybe just to the audience. Uh, You're welcome to post questions in the chat as Kevin goes along. We will answer and address it afterwards, but you will also be able to, to ask your questions. Um, we can time to talk if you want to. So Kevin, it's over to you. Thank you very much for the Thank you, Werner, and uh, thank you also to the CHPC for these uh, incredible resources uh, that we've been able to use. And of course, thank you all for uh, coming to, to hear what I have to say today. So I'm going to just quickly share my screen. Um, and um, I think, there we go. I think there was a, a, a typographic error on my, on my title, uh, but of course the correctly typed title is here. Um, as Werner has already said, uh, if I can maybe just get a, a laser pointer for later on, so I'll have that available. Um, as Werner has already said, um, yeah, I do have a research group growing. I've got some PhDs on the go, um, and there are several uh, completed PhD and MSc, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. But um, in my research group, we've got quite a, a wide area of interest. So we are interested, we're closely associated with the Rhodes uh, Research Unit in Bioinformatics uh, with Austin Tassin Bilsham. I'm close, closely associated with that group. Uh, but of course, I'm in the chemistry department and we do a lot of chemistry as well. So there's a, a wide range of interest running through the group. And I think you will see that coming through in the talk. So. The first part of a talk is going to be quite focused and you'll be able to follow the thread. And then a little bit after that, when I start talking about databases, you'll see it jumps around a bit. I'll go from student to student. But even though it jumps around, I hope you'll be able to see uh, the larger thread coming through. If I were to take the four interests, that very broad interest that I have in the research group, uh, we could maybe place them like this in a Venn diagram. And you would be able to see that there's some overlap uh, between the various areas. And of course, what's really nice in my research group is I'm always looking for projects. The real, real nice projects are the ones that are right in the middle that take bits of information or, or that require techniques from all of these research areas. And so it puts all of the interests together at once. And so I'm always looking for that. But many, many of the projects we have 
overlap one, two, or three, at least, of these different areas that we work with. And, and all of these, we are heavily dependent on the CHPC for all of us. And you can see some of the programs that we use, um, we, we uh, would be lost without access to the CHPC. Before I actually get into the talk, I just want to mention a couple of my students. So um, I had two students. Well, our postdoc is Dr. Snusi and an MSc, uh, Sopakama. Um, uh, they've both been working um, on the COVID-19 proteases, uh, really interesting projects, both using CHPC. Sopakama has just he will graduate in October. He's, he's got a distinction for his thesis. So for some of the work I'll speak on a little bit later, um, he's, he's, he's now uh, submitted and graduated. Um, I also have Yolanda, who's, uh, who is funded by Johnson Matty. I'll speak a bit about her work. Um, you'll notice that some of the students I show are actually part of Ruby, of the Rhodes University Bioinformatics Union, and others are in chemistry, so it, it kind of highlights my association, but we're all using the CHPC uh, for all of our work. Um, I have some other students, and um, so I've got uh, Fardad, who's working on simulations, um, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, both molecular mechanics and ab initio, um, and we're looking at simulations in, in liquids, really. Um, I'll speak a bit about uh, Washington's work. He's a PhD student. Uh, Bertha is really exciting. Bertha has done all of the work at CHPC. The project came from Briani Moses, who's a PI at CHPC, and she's just handed in her PhD and she will graduate in October. Um, another person who graduated in April is Bianford, and I'll speak a lot about his work. His is quite different. You see, he's not in Ruby, and he's done quite a bit of mechanistic work. So, and there are students, uh, these are not all the students, just a few students that I'm highlighting, and some of the work is going to come through um, in the talk as we go. So I'm going to start really with this kind of work, with the mechanistic kind of work. I'll speak, and you'll see the story coming through, uh, really the chemistry coming through. And then after that, I'm going to uh, divert a bit and talk about databases, and I'll come back uh, to talk about the mechanistic work in the virtual libraries that we work. So um, when you're working with mechanism, my view of working with mechanism in chemistry is like looking at an island. So you can imagine that if you were to come to an uninhabited island, you might want to put settlements on that island. And the question is, where would you place those settlements? Well, you would really look for, you would look for areas that are protected from the elements. So you might find an area near the top of a mountain, but not right on top of the mountain, an area near the top that's protected from the wind uh, that you can place a settlement. You might find other hollows that you will be able to place settlements. And you'll be able to place people, groups, you'll be able to place your towns at those minima. And this is really like the potential energy surface. Uh, in chemistry, we look for the minima. These are the places that are of interest to us. But of course, it's not just the minima that are of interest to us. We also need to know the relationship between these minima. And so how can we do that? When we look at the potential energy surface, what we've got to do, we've got to look at the mountain passes. And if we can find the mountain passes, uh, then we're in a very strong position to not have isolated communities. We are in a strong position to build roads and to find connections then between those minima. And so now you can start to find the relation between the towns. You can find the relation between uh, the structures that you're looking at, uh, in my case, often carbon cations, on the potential energy surface, and you can start to map out paths. So for example, have a look at those two towns over there. Those might be two, represent two uh, structures that I need to find a mechanism to connect. And um, what we could do is we could say, well, how can you get from town A to town B? Well, the shortest route might be that route over there. But notice that that route is going over a very steep mountain pass. And my old 1976 Ford Escort might not be strong enough to take that road. 
So what we might need to do is we might need to find a gentler route. And so we may need to search and we need, may need to go around a longer route to find our way from A to B. And this is the way I operate. We start finding the towns, we find the mountain passes, we find the connections. And once we have that network together, then we find the routes. And so I'm going to go back to a very old study. And this was just before I started using the CHPC. And I want to use the study because it very clearly shows how we can apply this kind of thinking to chemistry. And so this is the problem that I had to deal with. And the problem was in the lab, we had this structure over here. And this tosylate, it decomposed to form two very different structures. And as a, even as a chemist, you look at this and you step back and you can't see what on earth is going on. Of course, we do know that this is through carbocation intermediates. We will lose the tosylate group, we'll get carbocations. But even still, if you look at the structures of these carbocations, they're incredibly different for each other. And so how can we find, how can we find how the atoms rearrange themselves to get from something that looks like this, for example, to something that looks like that? And of course, we apply the methodology. So how do we find the towns? How do we find the towns on this island? Well, uh, the towns are quite easy to find because if you have a look at the systems, you'll notice they have a backbone, a norbornal backbone. And that norbornal backbone can be substituted at various positions. And we know what the substitution is. Those substitutes are present in the starting materials. Those substitutes are present in the products. So we can place them around. We can place them in all possible positions. And you can build up a library of substituted norbornal systems, which have substitutes at all possible positions. Now you've got your towns. And so how then can you find the mountain passes? So here, as an example, here is the one system where I've substituted, I've placed, I've placed a group at a particular position and there's a positive charge. Now we know the way these things transform uh, from one to the other is movement of groups to cover that positive charge. So that methyl group could move to another position like that. And since we know the geometry of moving from one side to the other, we know that geometry, we can start to calculate what the energy is, sorry, what the energy is of that transition. And so that energy then provides a mountain pass. So what we can do, and this is what we can do computationally, is we can generate all possible structures. And this work was done at the semi-empirical level initially. And there's a very important point that I need to make um, about uh, the use of semi-empirical work uh, that I'll make a bit later. But so we can then uh, just illustrate how low the town is or how high it is by the color of this node that we placed here. And of course, we can connect them. We know the types of transformations. We know the bond changes that will then lead through a mountain pass from one town to the other. And um, it's interesting, it's interesting, if you have a look at a methyl group here, there's a methyl group here, if it jumps across to this side, the positive charge will be on the other side. It's interesting that this transformation here just creates a mirror image. I don't know if you can see a mirror plane going through the paper, but some of these transformations actually lead to the same compound, exactly the same cation, carbocation. It leads to exactly the same cation, uh, simply a mirror image. So it's interesting that we can find a mountain pass that actually leads to the chemical itself, with the cation itself. But of course, when you fill in all of the details, this is what it looks like. You can find all of the towns, you can find all of the mountain passes, and now you can start to look for pathways. And of course, it's very simple to find the pathway when you've got everything there. You just search your way through and you can see this was the starting structure. That was the first decomposition product that leads to the first decomposition product. And if we follow our way around, this one here leads to our second decomposition product. So we know 
then the chemical transformations that lead from one to the other. We know exactly the path. But hang on, that's the shortest route around the that's the shortest route around the island. What about the long routes? There are other routes. There are longer routes that go all the way around here. What are those? Well, we simply need to look at the profile of the island. And then in this case, it's interesting that the shortest route, yes, there's a tall mountain pass to traverse, but then you've got hills. If you take the long route, you've got lots of mountains. So in this case, the shortest route is actually the simplest route. It is actually the nicest route. So the car will uh, easily take the shortest route. Um, so the longer route is going to be more difficult, not only in terms of length, but in terms of the time that it takes to traverse. So this is really interesting. And this is a problem that I would not have ever have been able to solve just by drawing a mechanism on paper, because one of the problems is, is that one of the decomposition products has to go back through the starting material to get to the second decomposition product. And never in my mind would I have thought that we'd have to go back to the start to find, uh, to find the second product. So um, an automated way of building up this network uh, is the only way that I could feasibly have solved or followed the, the transformation through. But now I need to talk about these optimizations being done at the semi empirical level. It's really important that when you change models, if you go from semi empirical to DFT, or as I'll show you a bit later, if you go from DFT to maybe MP2 or couple cluster, for example, we just need to be aware that the potential energy surface is going to change. The positions of your positions of your towns, positions of your of your mountain passes are all going to uh, move accordingly. And so what you see here, and particularly in these substitute and orbital systems, you see these classical cations, these classical norbornal cations um, tend to optimize. If I take these two structures to the CHPC, now to optimize them at the DFT or the MP2 or the couple cluster level, if I were to optimize them, I would end up uh, with a single structure from both of those. So the potential energy surface at the semi-empirical level has two towns. Uh, the potential energy surface at the DFT or higher levels has a single time, and that single time is a non classical structure. So you just have to be aware that, yes, uh, at the semi empirical level, you can get a general idea of the lay of the land. But if you want the detail, if you want the detail, that's going to be um, at the high level. And you have to be aware that your networks are going to change. And so, of course, um, here is what it looks like with the classical, but of course, if you optimizing at the DFT, you find that pairs will often optimize to a single structure. And so actually at the DFT level, you simplify quite a lot uh, the map, but you can still search the map. And so now the map uh, becomes, it becomes very easy to get from your starting point to your ending point. There they are right next to each other on the DFT surface. Interesting, it's so simple, yeah. But of course, it's something that I couldn't do mechanically on paper. You have to be an automated way to do it. Okay. Um, now, so this, there are different ways of looking at the final mechanism that's been derived from that. We can say, well, hang on, the first decomposition product leads to a cation that is identical to the cation formed here. Um, those two optimized to a single structure of the DFT. We have another intermediate. There's a concerted rearrangement between them, and we end up with the product. If we actually have a look um, at the structures, you can see that the transition state, you can see the uh, proton transfer is right at the center of that concerted rearrangement. So the high energy mountain pass is visible there, and you can see some uh, uh, methyl shifts at the center. You can see those. Um, so the DFT then really tells you about how where the atoms are going, and you can actually see and you can rationalize. It makes sense now as a chemist looking at the at the at the mechanism. But further to this, I don't know if I told you, if you remember me telling you about that transformation that makes a mirror image of a molecule. Um, what's interesting is that the graph 
that we build up shows that mirror image. Um, and the mechanism predicted from theory, what we do um, computationally tells us that there's that mirror image getting formed. And I had a student, Alicia Singh, uh, now Dr. Singh, um, who did some deuterium labeling. And now this is a stacked deuterium NMR here. And the moment you label the system isotopically, you end up, you end up uh, disturbing that mirror image. And so you can now in NMR differentiate between those two systems. And so this confirmed the mechanism that we got computational, com computation. So it's really this here validates the work that was done computationally and significantly. So um, I'm going to move on to another old study, but it's exactly the same thinking going through. And this is a quite an old study uh, from 2015, where again, um, when you try and justify how this cation, this carbocation rearranges into the dimethylcyclopentenol cation, um, it's really difficult to see where those atoms go. You can't just simply uh, pull this open because you, you end up, you don't end up with the system, you end up with a, uh, a, an ethyl group on a 5 membered system. So you can't, there's no easy way to see what the mechanism is going from one to the other. And this is one that is the, the resultant mechanism is not simple at all. And so there is actually, um, there's no way that one could draw errors to try and find that mechanism. You have to follow this model of creating an island, finding the settlements, finding the mountain passes to work. So in this case, these are all isomers of each other. So the way you can find the, the towns, the way you can find the towns is to find all possible isomers of the system. And so it's, it's quite simple. Uh, well, it's, it's quite straightforward to be exhaustive about this. You can easily put down every isomer that exists of C7H12, for example. And once you've got every isomer of C7H12, you can, you can uh, protonate or, or you can remove um, H minus, rather, uh, to form the type of cation. So the cations you form are all isomers of the two uh, structures where we were trying to find a mechanism for. I'm not going to go into detail as to how to find the mountain passes, but short of to say that if you know the types of reactions or the types of mechanism that are available to cations, like methyl shifts, hydride shifts, um, rearrangements, ring openings, for example, if you know those, you can create geometries that closely resemble transition states. And from that, you can determine transition states. So from each of the cations you produce here, you can produce mountain passes. And so what happened uh, in this case is that we were able to produce about 4,500 mountain passes connecting uh, about uh, 1,200 towns. Now, I can't plot the full graph here. Here's part of it. The question is now, is it possible to get from uh, the Tuna Warner pattern to the DMC plus pattern? And actually it is. This was done at the DFT level. And again, um, I, when I change the level, uh, the, the, the map is going to change. It's done at the DFT level, but of course, now it becomes very easy to search that graph. And it's interesting that there is a two-step. <laughs> There's a two-step that goes from one to the other. And I, I, I can't follow this through in my mind. I've tried to put it there. It takes me a while to go through it and to follow each atom through. And so I could sit here for 10 minutes and follow each atom through and then know which atom is there at the start and where is the end. But I hope that in the slide, you can see that the intermediate that's form is somewhere between uh, the starting material and the product. Um, but this two-step process at the DFT level takes over 100 kilocalories per mole to, to go. So this is a really steep mountain path. So although it's two-step, it's not one that we could have really put on paper before, and although it's two-step, it's not really feasible in terms of um, accounting for the transformation between the E2 and the DMC. 
So what we try and do is try and find a longer route around the island. And the longer route was taken from DFT, and the longer route, everything that's even close to the longer route uh, has been put to a much higher level. And so the map changes slightly. And so you can see that we've got many pathways that we can follow. You see the color indicates the height of the mountain path or the depth of the uh, town that you have. And so you can follow this through to find a route. Now, if you look at the profile of this, if you look at the profile of the map, this is what it looks like. And so you can start to see where the towns are and where the mountain passes are. But what's quite interesting is that there are so many ways to get from A to B. Um, I gave up counting at 10 to the nine pathways, um, different ways of getting from A to B. Um, but of course, if you know from literature, there were only two pathways published in literature before this. So you can see that at 10, 10 to the nine pathways, uh, does uh, is is an improvement, but I need to caution this route, and you just need to be aware of the limitations of this route. Is that you can be try and be as thorough as you can about finding the mountain paths and the towns, and statistically, when you've got so many, you you've got a good chance of getting a good mechanism from it. Uh, just note that this method did not reproduce one of the pathways in the literature. So although we've got many pathways from A to B. Uh, following this method, we haven't got every single one because it's a literature pathway that exists that's not in this method. Just a side, uh, a side to this, this, this map of the island has been generated. Um, it's interesting to go back and look at some old papers. Here's a paper from 1993. And this paper from 1993 looks at the pathway between a seven Norbornal system and the two Norbornal system that we're looking at right now. What's interesting is that long after I set up the pathways, I was became made aware of this paper. And so I decided to search for this pathway in the, in the map that I'd already set up. And it is there, it is there, that pathway is there. However, there's some problems with the pathway that I've found that even when I increase it to higher levels, is that the pathways I find have a lower hill than the one in this paper. They've got a lower hill and they don't end, they don't end up at the town that's over here. They end up at a lower town. So the pathways I've found don't explain this transformation. They explain the transformation of this to much more stable products via easier routes than following this pathway. So what this does is it portions again, because my original study was based on mass spectrometry, where, where in vacuo calculations are absolutely fantastic. This particular study, uh, of course, is in super acidic media, and the media is really, really different to the um, isolated and vacuum systems that we've been looking for. So the map here is maybe not really appropriate in this other situation, but it's really interesting that there is a pathway that exists in the system. Okay, here's, um, I've got a couple more studies like this. Um, here's an interesting study where Alicia was was, was trying to twist molecule, well, was trying to make this uh, diferential sulfite over here. Well, she made the diferential sulfite, but when you make this in the lab, what happens in the NMR is you see the formation of this pair of signals. And this pair of signals are from protons on one fentanyl system and a proton on the other fentanyl system. But at the same time, you see another overlapping pair over here that also correspond to a proton on one fentanyl system and a proton on the other. And the way we explain this is that when this diferential sulfide is formed, what happens is that you get two different versions of it. The two different versions are rotamins, where the bonds are rotated and the orientations are different. And the rotation between these, trying to twist them one to the other, takes a lot of energy, which means they become isolated. So the two systems, these rotamers are, the two rotamers that are formed are quite isolated. And the rotamers are just rotation about four bonds. 
There's a carbon oxygen bond, a carbon sulfur, uh, sulfur oxygen, oxygen sulfur, and a carbon oxygen bond. And just rotation around that leads to these systems. So the question is, how can we explain uh, these? And how can we look? And the problem is that you've now got four rotatable bonds. There, there's so many ways you can rotate even one of them. The moment you start to try and rotate four bonds, there's so many millions and millions of ways you can twist this molecule. How can you find the twisting that leads to one NMR signal and the twisting that leads to another NMR signal? How can you find it? And so the approach is the same. Uh, just, just before I go into the approach, just a word. This is um, the reaction that led towards it. You can see uh, that thionyl chloride is already added to one fentanyl system, fentanyl alcohol system, uh, system. And of course, the other one's coming in, and we can get a transition state. And we end up, and of course, if you can find a whole range of transition states, as we did, a whole range of transition states, yes, you've got the starting material, but of course, they lead to a range of products where all the twisting is different in all the products. So the rotomers that you get directly from the transition states are different. So it's quite clear that you can have formation um, of, of separate rotomers of these systems. And so how can we find it today? Well, following the same procedures before, and I presented this work before, is we find the towns and we find the mountain passes. And the mountain passes here are just twisting the molecule. Uh, there's energy associated in trying to rotate around a bond. And so that energy is there. And so we thought we had explained it quite well and we found areas of towns where that are closely associated to each other and an inaccessible town as well. And that was able to explain uh, the two, the, the two uh, sets of signals we're seeing in NMR. And so you're able then to see one set and the other. And of course, if you provide temperature to the system, uh, anything that's in these towns has enough energy to go to those towns. And so you see that transformation as well. So we felt that this was <laughs> absolutely a perfect explanation. This was done at semi semi level. But of course, although <laughs> After acceptance by tetrahedron, they, they used the semi-empirical on the cover. And the paper wasn't accepted with the semi-empirical. So we had to uh, redo the map um, at, at, um, uh, at uh, uh, the DFT level. And so we, we felt that in reviewing, in revision of the paper, we just go all out and, and throw all we had. And so we generated this number of Confirmations at the molecular mechanics level. And the problem being that if you've got so many, how do you differentiate between them? Uh, well, of course, if you have a look here, um, uh, this is an overlay of many, uh, of a lot of these. And you can see they're very close to each other, they're very closely aligned. So, what we're seeing is roughness on the potential limiting surface. So, the towns that we've created are in tiny, tiny little pockets. Now, how do you find the real places? And so it was quite interesting to cut down the number. Um, I, I use an analogy of, of filling the island with water. You can imagine the sea level rising, that the, the water will rise and rise and rise until it gets to a mountain pass. And then suddenly it will flood. It'll flood the, 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 the valley or the dip in the island. And you can see that if you rise the, get the sea level to this point, It'll flood this area over here suddenly. And so on the four-dimensional potential in the surface, we're able to fill it with water. You can see where the basins where it floods. And of course, uh, you want to then go back to look at these little basins and try and flood those and see if you can find small basins and so on. So it's a recursive process. But of course, that was able to cut it down. And so the map looks like this. And at the DFT level, yes, the map looks quite different. We've got many more towns. But overall, it's the same. We're seeing those three areas over there, and those three areas are really explained in the scene in the map. Okay. Right. The final, as uh, the final point that I would tell you that I want to talk about is um, a, a more recent study. So this has just been accepted in Journal of Molecular Structure, and what we're looking at in it's a, it's actually quite a different product problem, even though we're looking at at, at structures in the map. This is a variable temperature study. And of course, on these two azobenzimidazoles, um, of course, there are two rotomers. There's restricted 
rotation around an abide bond, there's restricted rotation that leads to these rodents. But the problem is this. If you optimize this, which we which uh, was done in CHPC, you optimize that, you optimize that, you get two energies. That difference in energy does not relate to the difference in energy you can calculate from NMR. The question is, what's going on here? Why does that energy not correlate? Well, should we put in solvent effects? Yes, you, you, can, you can correct for solvent, but that's still not explaining why. And so the explanation, I think, is slightly more complex than that, is that, of course, yes, you have the SS rotomone. He has one of them. But of course, you've got rotatable bonds there. There are many different conformations that are available to the SS. You can see all of them here. And you can see the, the towns laid out. And also for the S-trans, there are also many different towns. And there's a network of, of relations between them. And so I think the bottom line is when you look at the energy for the one isomer and the energy for the other, you can see even though they can freely uh, interconvert one to the other, and you can follow that at temperature, what you can see is that there are many different conformations available to each. And so if you want to compare the energy that you're seeing in NMR, you're not trying to com you're not trying to compare a single system here and a single system here. What you're trying to compare is a population on the one side and a population on the other side. And I think that these maps really highlight that the, the, the kind of concepts that are, are really important in trying to rationalize what's observed in, in modern systems. Okay. So um, there's my, my statement. We have islands. We find towns, we find mountain passes, and then, of course, we have a mechanism for it. But, of course, I have students uh, who work well beyond that, and so they, they like to go a little bit off the, uh, off, off the island uh, or maybe to much bigger islands or to continents to try and uh, look at things. So I'm going to speak a little bit about students and what they've done. So uh, one of my PhD students who's funded by Johnson Mackey is... Uh, Yolanda Novikosa, and what she's doing is she's trying to do predictive mass, spe mass spectrometry. And of course, you can imagine that with mass spectrometry, you are trying, you're really trying to build up libraries, fragments. And so it's a similar kind of process, but different. You're not on the single island. The question is how do you create those fragments? How do you start with a system that you're trying to fragment? How do you create those? Those, those different fragments, how do you build up this library? And of course, you can tell when your library isn't good enough is, is that when your uh, experimental mass spectra does not match with theoretical. You see, you don't have enough in your library um, and you don't have enough detail in terms of the, of the repetition of the fragments as they come through. So building up these libraries in, in, in computation is really important. And so some of which is done on the CHPC has been in terms of trying to follow Grimmer's method of QCEIMS. And of course, with Grimmer's method, what, what you do is you use molecular dynamics to fragment, to fragment molecules or to fragment radical cations to get fragments and you build up the elements of that. But of course, uh, building that is quite tricky. Of course, if you're building up uh, libraries for mass spectrometry, of course, the management of those libraries is really important. You need to track fragments that get formed. You need to track how many times they get formed as you follow the process through. Of course, she is trying other techniques, of course, in fragmenting in a more systematic way, and we're having quite interesting success uh, in this. Uh, but look out for this if you can improve. Okay. Um, I'm going to now divert a little bit. <laughs> We've been generating libraries all ourselves. Uh, and so I want to maybe start looking at databases. And um, the problem with these libraries that I've spoken of now is that they're very focused to a particular chemical issue or a chemical problem, but they are really, really narrow in terms of chemical space. And there are some times when generating your own library is just simply not good enough. 
and you actually need some chemical diversity uh, that you know a virtual library will not provide. And so our our focus, the way we work, is that we start with a local DB. We do some very fast screening um, on a local DB a database, and of course, then we send it to CHPC and we bring it back from the CHPC for analysis. And there are two databases that in my research group we, we use quite a lot. Uh, one is the SANCDB, um, and I'll speak a bit about the SANCDB, it's really incredible in terms of chemical diversity. And the other database is the Zinc database, which is also incredible, but in terms of sheer number of, of compounds. So these are the main that we work with. So let me just tell you a little bit why I use the SANCDB. Um, and SANCDB, uh, comes from uh, the bioinformatics research unit and uh, spearheaded by Oslin Hassan Bishop. And I don't have, um, uh, on the update to SANCDB, I couldn't find a picture for Michael and Thomas on this to add to this, but this is really a fantastic update to the uh, natural compounds database. What I really like about it is that I can download a copy and use it locally. And for me, that's really important. For my students, it's really important that we have, have it locally so we can do our fast screening, you know, and screening across the web. But it has other aspects to it that I really enjoy. Uh, for example, um, if you find a hit, if you find some compound in the compound database uh, that is fantastic, uh, then you can easily find analogs. Uh, the thing to be, you go back onto the web page and find analogs that will then help. Um, of course, um, as well, being a natural compounds database, it has chemical diversity that only a natural compounds database can have, which is really great. And um, of course, I also use the zinc database quite a lot. And again, we use a local copy of zinc uh, for uh, fast access. It's, it's quite a large database. Um, so uh, fast access is quite, uh, having it local is really useful to us. Um, but of course, the number of compounds in zinc is really, really fantastic. So, for example, um, PhD student Washington Dendera is looking at glycosal transferases. Uh, and so uh, it's really important to be able to inhibit uh, these glycosal transferases in terms of certain cancers where they're overexpressed. And so he's been screening, uh, among other work he's been doing, he's been screening compounds from the South African Natural Compounds database uh, to, to find inhibitors. In it. So, and, and all the work, all the screening has been doing is being at this. So it's, it's really great. So use of it, that's use of the SANCDB. What about use of zinc? Here's uh, work done by Bianca Zemura. Um, I really worried that I was on an island too much. Um, and so I gave a problem to Bianca, which, which took us off an island, and that was um, on uh, the Diels Alder reaction, and there's a very good reason for choosing the Diels Alder reaction is that there's an entropic uh, problem that I you don't have when you're on an island. You don't have an entropic problem. You need to have the orientation of uh, your reactants. You have to have your uh, diene and your dienophile really, really perfectly aligned. Uh, and if you want to try and calculate mountain passes, if you want to try and get those position states, so it's really not an easy. A problem to automate to to get transition states. So just as a starting point into moving off islands, I've handed this over to him, and he's got. Uh, there's a third paper he's got coming out, and um, what he's done is he we can have access to the zinc database. So on the zinc database, what you do is you search the zinc database and you find deals older adducts. So the products of deals older adducts, you can find many and many of them. And so he has a workflow that can very reliably produce a transition state, an exact transition state. And this is incredibly useful, but he didn't stop there. Um, what he's done is in his automated workflow is that you can calculate IRCs and then do some interesting, interesting analysis of the IRCs uh, in this. And he's been able to look very closely at different types now of deals old reactions because this, we have the statistical background from the zinc database. We can, we can study so many different reactions. And now you can start to see differences um, in the RCs, particularly of these reactions. So just how do you set up uh, 
transition, how do you set up these transition states? Well, it's workflows like from Zinc, you have the smiles. You can use RDKit to get your, your 3D structures. You can do constrained optimization to guess your transition state. You can get, uh, then take the highest energy point and then you can get a semi-empirical transition state. You can take that then to high level DFT to get a DFT. And this is really successful. We're getting a 90% from his work, we're getting a 90, 95% a success rate in, in fields over transitions in the generation. But of course, that's led now to his analysis of that. And his analysis has been really, uh, really interesting. And you can start to see because there are two bonds that are formed in the Diels Alder reaction. And are they formed synchronously and, or are they formed asynchronously? And you can see from reaction, he's done reaction force analysis. So he has the energy of the IFC, and you can see the first and second derivatives. And you can see clear differences in the reaction force where the, the Diels Alder IFC is, is synchronous or where there's asynchronous. But that's not all he's done. Please have a look at his GitHub. Uh, I had a link to his GitHub repository. Uh, the the uh, Adamar program is on GitHub. And of course, uh, his studies, I've looked at his studies at far and depth. He's looked at bond orders, he's looked at charges, he's looked at classifi classification of the different types of deals. Um, just by the way, all his work was at CHPC and he's now graduated in April. So it's really is a fantastic part of work. And I think. I mentioned three of his papers here. Uh, well, one's under review. There are another two papers he's also managed to author in the year at the MSC level, which is really, really fantastic work. I'm going to still look at databases, but maybe move back a bit to virtual libraries. So apologies for the abrupt change in topic. But another topic of interest we've been looking at is uh, the, the COVID proteases. And of course, there are two proteases. There's a main protease for COVID and a, a pain-like protease for COVID. And they have a job. They have a single job in the life cycle of the COVID-19 virus. Their job is to cut up a polyprotein into pieces. And some of these pieces, like for instance, this piece here is the main protease. So that will have to fold. And this piece includes the pain-like protease. It has to be cut up uh, for the machinery for COVID to be produced so that new virus can be produced. So it's really important. These are really important. And so what we've done is we've had a look at it. So for example, if you can uh, then uh, inhibit, uh, if you can inhibit that uh, enzyme, you can then slow down the life cycle of, uh, of, uh, of COVID. What's, uh, I'll speak a little bit more about the difference between these two proteins. But of course, uh, in Bungi, what, what Boogie did was to try and find acrylamides. And acrylamides are compounds that will bind irreversibly. They'll form a permanent covalent bond to a protease. And the way Boogie did this was search the zinc database for these acrylamides. And then they can then undergo a Michael addition to the protease. And now they're stuck to the protease and the protease cannot do performance function and so you can uh, then uh, slow the life cycle of, of them. But just a caution with zinc. I don't know if you can see that this is an impossible triangle. If you have a look there, I hope you can see that that's impossible. It's not something that we could construct. And here's an impossible cube. Just be careful when you look at really big databases. Uh, like the zinc database, really, really large database, is that you can have molecules that are possible. You can see you can have R centers at both bases, but of course, uh, you can have, if you try and change that R to an S, you end up with something that you can't make. You can end up with a molecule that's not really possible. And of course, when we search for acrylamides, <laughs> we found quite a few of these uh, in the database. So, so there's a lot of filtering you have to do in RD kit. Uh, before you take your work to the CHPC, just to make sure that the structures you have are valid. Here's another way you could try and try and draw it, but of course, uh, now you've got to try and put an, uh, a hydrogen atom in this area here. It just doesn't work. It's, this is really is an impossible molecule, and yet this molecule is recorded in the zinc database. So you've got to be very careful about that. So of course, the boogie searched the zinc database for, for acrylamides that look like this, and filtered out 
using Arctic kit acrylamides that looked like these ones. We didn't want the heteroatoms near the reactor center for the micro emission. And so, of course, on the CFPC, high throughput screening, this is bread and butter what we do on, on a very regular basis is we screen. This here is non covalent docking, it was done on the CFPC using uh, order of vinyl. Uh, of course, we also did the covalent docking. So, what was important here was to just check that the reactive center for Michael addition was right where the sulfur for Michael addition in the protease, so that it so that the uh, ligand would then covalently bind after this. And of course, we did the covalent binding using glide again on the CFPC. So we set it up in Schrodinger and we sent the scripts through to uh, using the lovely scripts that are available. But of course, uh, we lose information. So you can see here that's beautifully bound here yeah, through Michael addition. The acrylamide is now fully bound. But of course, just a, a word of caution is that I found that sometimes working with Schrodinger, you lose information at the starting of your process going through. And of course, we were already, we used NIME a lot. We were already analyzing the molecules. But what we had to do was after, after getting results back from the CHPC, we had to, to figure out what molecule had been used. We had to write a Python script to undo the Michael addition using RDKit so that we could determine what molecule we had docked a covalently in the first place, which is quite an interesting thing. So, yes, and sometimes there is some post processing of results that we have to do. Of course, I've got two students. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Sanusi has done some work. And really, what's interesting about this cutting of the polyprotein is that the points. I've spoken of this polyprotein for COVID. Uh, there are points that are cleaved by the main protease, and there are points that are cleaved by the propane like protease, which don't have the arrows. And so, really, we wanted to explore a structural basis and why uh, for that recognition, the recognition of this point by the propane and not, for instance, by the main protease. So, it's really interesting. And so, we've explored two cleavage points with Dr. Sanusi. Um, and that's about to be submitted. So extremely long dynamics on the GPU cluster, uh, uh, on the GPU cluster at CHPC. Um, and we've got some really interesting results. Here it's clear cut why the propane like proteas uh, cleaves at that point. But here it's not so clear. And so it's really some interesting um, uh, work that's come through as to why uh, the propane should cleave here and not the main proteas at that point. So it's really interesting. And of course, Sopakam Zabo has just completed his master's, will graduate. And um, he's also explored just simply recognition of substrate by the, by the main protease. And so, of course, from experiment and from literature, we know what sequences look like, what, what the substrate should look like. But uh, he's looked more in depth as to that recognition. And to do that, He's built up virtual libraries. He's built up huge virtual libraries and checked his form complexes of these virtual libraries with the main protease, and they bind correctly. They are exactly the way uh, they should do. You see the recognition at that point. But what's interesting is that when you take these libraries through to molecular dynamics, and, and this is just a couple of them the PCA analysis of the molecular dynamics, you can start to see differences. And he's come up with a way to try and describe the differences uh, between the motions um, under dynamics when one substrate is present compared to another substrate that's present. And um, it's not infallible, uh, but it's, it's largely works. Um, he has a way that each comparison in this, in, this, in this diagram, each comparison is comparing a molecular dynamic simulation with another molecular dynamic simulation. So this is really interesting work. And this does then give insight as to certain, uh, as to certain uh, substrates and um, how they affect the motion of the protein and therefore how the difference in, re in recognition of substrate then works in the system. So that's really, really interesting. Yeah. And then finally, I'm going to go back to uh, maybe more focused virtual libraries, but still work in a biological sense. Um, I just want to mention just briefly some work by, done by uh, Dr. Sagaki, by Lisa Sagaki. And there's a paper 
um, that uh, was published last year, but there's there's some other papers that are about to be submitted now from this work. And what he what he done is he's created he's what he's done is he's created um, a program that's a GitHub derivatize me. And derivatized me can decorate molecules. So you can see this molecule here, it can be decorated. And of course, that'll create a virtual library. It'll absolutely be a fantastic virtual library that can use. But it's not just creating two dimensional structures, it's creating usable three dimensional structures. So, for instance, yes, you can create all of these. But remember that it's not just the two dimensional structures that are produced, it's fully usable, optimized three-dimensional structures. Now, how efficient is this program? It's really important in terms of decoration. For example, if you take a huge molecule with many sites to, to uh, decorate, to change, if you take uh, possum prenipur, for example, it's a huge molecule, and you try and decorate with bromine chlorine methyl groups, for example, you try and decorate it to produce a whole lot of 3D structures, huge 3D structures, how long will it take you? Well, to take to produce a million of these structures on a single core will take you about an hour, and then you will have a million structures that you can then use in databases. You can then take to machine learning, et cetera, um, and you can then filter out and whatever point. So how has this program helped further research that is done? Well, one interesting problem looked at is in terms of psychic peptides and uh, the interaction with psychopilin D. This is in the context of things like heart attack or, or uh, where you uh, uh, have removal of oxygen from cells. So it's really important to look at the interaction with the protein psychopilin D. Problem with molecular docking is that molecular docking doesn't often take into account confirmation. So what happened is we felt confirmation of ring systems was really important. So I wrote a program on using uh, that I ran on the GPU cluster. At that stage, I, I was using systems with 16 gigabits. So I ran out of memory on the GPUs very quickly um, to generate confirmations. But he had a far superior way. He used replica exchange molecular dynamics. And he was very able, he was able to very quickly get much better variation and confirmation of the ring system than I was. And he was able to identify important confirmations from that molecular dynamics. Now, these psychic systems are all mainly glycine all the way around through. And so they're not really useful in terms of binding to, to proteins to biological the system. So what did he do? He used the derivatized me to introduce the amino acids into the system. So by substituting with isopropyl, you can get valine by substituting with it. Uh, methyl, you can alanine, and so on. And so he was able to build up protein and psychic peptide sequences from a multi-glycine with some uh, special groups added just for synthesizability. Uh, but mainly glycine, he was able to, to, to generate virtual 3D libraries of, uh, of with many, many different uh, amino acid sequences. And his libraries of the 12 different confirmations ended up being about 15 billion. So the question is, is, is such a large li library really useful? Well, yes, yes. He took samples from each of the 12 confirmations and doctor against the cyclopilin B, and we got, we got some really, really promising uh, hits from that on cyclopilin. So here are some of the really promising hits. But what's really interesting is that you can generate uh, using other tools and then dock. And this is the range of binding in cyclopilin B. Here's cyclosporin, which is known to bind to cyclopilin B. There it is. But from each of that, this is the range from the sample. Here's the mean uh, binding energy. But you see that there are many, many, many. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of structures to now work through that are binding in a much better way to cyclopilin B, and certainly in a far superior way than cyclosporin. So, my apologies for jumping from piece to piece, but maybe if I can just give a very quick overview. I started this uh, presentation speaking about islands, and on the slide I can show you some of the islands that have been generated uh, in the research group. But of course, I have one student, Bienford, who has been trying to get off the island. 
And so he's been very successfully being able to look at, at transition states that are not as easy to produce like rotational transition states, like isomerizations. He's been able to reliably produce uh, transition states that can be analyzed. And he's got the tools for analyzing with Amidon. And then, of course, there's a biological bent to my work. And of course, in various studies, we've done covalent docking, where we use virtual libraries, where we use sanctibule zinc, for example, uh, in cases like uh, with uh, glycosal transferases, cancer, COVID-19, for example, and cyclobulin B. So that hopefully gives you an overall overview, but in all of those, all of these cases, what's common is that we're working with libraries, whether we generate the libraries or whether we're using it from database, we're using libraries in almost all of the work. Okay. And then I'm pretty sure that I will have omitted someone that I need to say thank you to on the slide. So if your name is here and it, if your name is not here, please, it should be. And so please, there are some students, current students and past students that I really need to thank. And some collaborators, I hope I've missed out collaborators here. And of course, I need to thank the team at CHBC because uh, almost all of this work is done at the CHPC and graduation of students, um, these papers we're getting out would be impossible uh, without um, the access to the hours, the, the, what was it, nine times 10 to the six hours that we, we've used so far. And thank you to collaborators, thank you to funders, thank you to CHPC, thank you to the Ruby group that I'm associated with for the support that I get from them as well. Okay, and thank you to you for listening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, a fantastic talk. Um, very, very interesting. Um, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, it's um, it was good to just take the time and get some sense of the, let's call it the diversity and complexity of the work that that is being done in your group. And and you certainly managed this well. I I, I want to agree with one of the people, Rola Kubayo, that commented. She said, "Full presentation, well done." <laughs> So, so I agree with that. Uh, and for me, it is interesting, especially in the first part of your presentation, where it seems like you actually had followed some brute force methods to just cover possibilities to identify, say, say low energy structures and so on. Um, so, so it was, it is, and, and how you then took this and, and, and developed methods to, 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 I suppose, streamline that process. I mean, this is just, just a very good, good approach. So, I mean, I like that. The, the, the talk, the part about the virtual libraries. I can see there's a lot of work that goes into this to the benefit of the, the community. Um, and then also your GitHub products, uh, pro, or projects. I, I think this is just showing that you, what you learn, you make it available to the community. I think so all of this is, is excellent. There's one or two questions. Um, I just want to ask from my side, just because I, I draw my interest is you mentioned that you also go to really high level of theory in some cases to optimize structures. You mentioned about perturbation theory, the MP2 stuff, you had the couple clusters. Uh, I mean, those are really um, uh, intensive calculations. How often do you do this? And, and does those kind of calculations, I suppose, is really where the CHPC is, is, is coming to, to great benefit? Or is it not something that you really do that much? Well, um, particularly with those very high levels, um, you'll notice that where I mentioned it, the systems mm. were incredibly small. So it was six, yeah. seven yeah. systems, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, of course, on the larger systems, we step back just a little bit. But of course, yeah. this is impossible. Uh, you can see what, and I think that that nine times 10 to the six hours doesn't include uh, okay. some work that was done before CHPC as well mm. on, that, mm. on, the, mm. on the couple mm. of cluster work. I think it was before Lingard. Yeah. yeah. No, no, so that, but that, that is interesting. Um, I see one or two questions there in the, in Chat, uh, Kevin, you will probably also see. I see Thomas Bruce Chuat is asking, "What free energy methods do you use at the CHPC?" I don't know whether you. So for free energies, um, we're simply uh, using vibrational analysis, whichever tool we're using. So our common tool that we're using is 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 Gaussian nine or Gaussian sixteen now at the CHPC. Yeah. I don't okay. know if that answers Thomas, the Thomas, uh, yeah, you can indicate, but maybe let's get to the, the next question. He's from Samuel Mabakane. He's from, from CHPC. He's asking excellent, or he's saying excellent scientific work. And then he asks, visualization tools do you use to analyze the structure of the molecules? Okay. So 
and I have some favorite tools for visualization. Uh, for graphs, of, of course, it's graph viz that, that you all use that I'm using in terms of uh, the, the graphs that are built up and the relationships. But in terms of molecular structures, um, I really like the simplicity of ChemCraft. And so uh, I have a license for ChemCraft and, and straight from CHPC back, I can see, I can follow through, um, I can get publication ready uh, diagrams. Mm -hmm. uh, for more biological systems, I'm really enjoying uh, Discovery Studio Visualizer, the free version. And so many okay. of the structures I've done, my students like Pymol, but I personally prefer Discovery Studio Visualizer for, for my students. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So yeah, there's not, I don't see questions, but anybody is welcome to, to put up your hand if you want to, to ask the, the questions correctly. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing it at the moment, uh, Kevin, but I, 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 I can, can just say again, this, this talk was, was good. And, and, and I, I like the way that you, you, you started it that I think even people that are not as skilled maybe in the field could appreciate um, what you do. I think uh, maybe some people even in the chemistry domain might not realize how complex the work really is that you are doing. I think this is, this is I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't claim to understand everything under the scene, but I can appreciate that, that some of the effort that needs to go into doing the work that you do is, is quite significant. And I'm just pleased that the CHPC can play a part to, to, to make it happen. Um, and 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 I, I'm grateful for the acknowledgement that you are you are also giving. Um, so yeah, I don't see any more questions, Kevin. So I think we, we sorry, can, can wrap I it can up there. Oh, sorry, Stephen. Um, please, please. Uh, I, I don't see you anyway. I can put up my hand. So sorry for interrupting. Oh, sorry. Uh, Prof, I have a, a few uh, questions. Sorry, I'm I'm Stephen Kutsi. I'm from uh, a postdoc at uh, Wits University, working with Ord Mun Munro. Um, I just, I'm curious about the skills, because I see a lot of your MSc students, and I see a lot of advanced work in terms of, you know, automation and flow. So I'm curious about the skills that you uh, find the most useful and the skills you also find the most difficult to develop in students, in, um, in terms of your work. Okay. Uh, the first question is, it's easy to answer. <laughs> Um, I really love my association with the Rhodes University Bioinformatics Unit because the students come through MSc and the skill I find most important in my work is Python. That, that for me is the most important. And I think, given a little chance to think about your second, I also think that that might be one of the more difficult ones. And so if I can just clarify what I mean by one of the more difficult ones, is that I really enjoy the skills that come in in terms of, of, of Python. But when it comes to organization of code and classes and, and things like that in terms of the Python scripting, I find that quite difficult. Um, of course, you can do quite a lot without creating your own classes in Python. You can do quite a lot. And so people tend to not structure the code appropriate, uh, in, in a nicer way. And it's getting over that and is quite, quite, I find quite, quite tricky. I've had a couple of students that have managed the transition absolutely beautifully, beautifully uh, but, but it's, it's quite a difficult transition to, to go through. Do you think that, that the lack of skills in terms of classes might be that the courses teaching Python stopped just before that? And it's a time, and it's a time, it's a, yeah. it's a time okay. issue as well, it's, it's what you can manage in the time of teaching. Okay, and then my last question, so is uh, when you talk about these flows that these students develop, uh, is all of this done manually, as in you go from uh, Gaussian and they create all of these structures, they create jobs, and then have to execute them on the cluster, or are we talking about stuff where they uh, perhaps automate all of the steps in between, so automated okay. submission of Gaussian jobs? Yeah. Um, so a favorite of ours is GNU, Par GNU Parallel. <laughs> and that really, um, for, for multiple Gaussian jobs, uh, for multiple, uh, for, for high throughput screening, it, it really is, is, is lovely. Yeah. And, and I'm sure the other ways uh, to to spread out your work 
uh, and maybe if I'm doing it wrong, I can be <laughs> corrected, but the new parallel is, is, is a favorite. I'll have a look at it. Thanks, Prof. Uh, and a, no, thank an absolutely fantastic talk. Sorry, Rob. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you, Stefan, for, for those good questions. Um, but yeah, we are running out uh, over time a bit, Kevin, but uh, we are, I think um, I speak on everybody still on the call that um, huge appreciation for your, your willingness and, and the good talk that you've given. And maybe just to remind everybody, this talk is recorded. It's on our YouTube channel. That YouTube link is in the original invite sent to all. So Kevin, if you want to make use of it to distribute, you're more, more than welcome. So thank you, everybody that joined. And until our next webinar, which we will announce again, um, take care and, and enjoy the weekend and keep well. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.